everyone, and welcome to the Changemakers Organising School. Um, I'm Will, uh, the delivery coordinator for the school, uh, and it's great to see all your lovely faces as you filter through. Um, today is, uh, this is our first session of um, our first season for this year, whose topic is how small groups can make big change. And I'm really excited um, to get this season started. It's, it's something that's really close to my heart. I want to begin by acknowledging that across Australia, we are meeting on the unceded lands of Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Uh, I want to acknowledge elders, um, particularly the Darug elders, as I am meeting you all today on the lands of the Darug people. And I'd like to also acknowledge my elders as a proud Gunagara man. I'd like to pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, who are with us today. So the reason this is close to my heart is because when I was 16, going through high school on Darra country in Northwest Sydney, um, I started my own local uh, small group. I was concerned about the changing climate and the impact it would have on my future. I remember when I first became alarmed. I was in geography. We were shown a graph of projected emissions and what each increase in a degree would look like. There were pictures of bushfires ravaging homes, floods sweeping through towns and islands being swallowed by the ocean. I'll never forget that picture of what six degrees looked like. It was the collapse of all life on earth. But as I looked around to my friends, nobody else seemed to feel the way I did. In that moment, the world around me hadn't changed, but my view of it had. I started researching climate change, and the more I learned, the more I decided I needed to act. I sent emails to the Prime Minister and to other cabinet ministers, but got only automatic replies. Then I decided to meet my principal, where he told me that parents and students would get upset if we wasted the school's limited funds on solar panels. It wasn't a priority for them. In organising, they say that sometimes your en enemy organises your people. It was at this moment that I realised that acting on my own, nobody was going to listen to me or take me seriously. And the principal had given me a challenge, that if I could get enough students and parents to understand the seriousness of the climate crisis, then he would act. To cut a long story short, I formed a student climate group and was launched into the world of change making. Although solar panels never made it to my high school, they sit on top of every council building in the Hawkesbury, and our group has had many other local wins. Though, just like I learned that I couldn't change the world on my own, I learned very quickly that a single small group on its own can't make all the change. Our state and federal governments weren't taking action and emails to ministers were still returning with automatic replies. So when the school strikes for climate started, we were eager to join other small groups who were forming around the country on the same issue. What I learned from this experience is how important it is to have local groups at the heart of decision-making. When COVID restrictions were in place and as and us as school strikers wanted to protest the gas-led recovery, having groups like mine who were able to respond to their local conditions in their strategy and actions made a big difference. We were able to do this because it was members of diverse small groups like mine working together who led the campaign. And because of that, they did so in a way that was adaptable to different situations and communities. I learned that while bigger groups hold a lot more power due to their size and network of influence, there is also a real power in small groups leading what happens in their communities. But in order for these small groups to be able to lead in their communities, people like me in my local group in Northwest Sydney need to have the skills to do so. Through my organizing in a local group, I found that there were eight really important skills that I had to learn. It is around these skills that we've designed this season on how small groups can make big change. When I started my group as a teenage introvert, I needed it to grow and I needed to collaborate with others outside of my group to make change. To do that, I needed to learn how to build good relationships. So next week's session is on how to build those crucial organizing relationships. Once I had grown the group, it was really important for us to make change that we worked effectively together and in doing so embraced our diversity. So the following week's session is on how to have an effective group dynamic. With our group dynamic sorted, we needed to run productive meetings that allowed everyone to have a fair say. So meetings is the topic of our fourth session. At our meetings, we were coming up with great, great ideas for events but often these were never followed up on. What we needed were people who were capable and willing to take leadership and ownership of these events and tasks we came up with. Leadership is hence the topic of our fifth week. In my group, we've always had a lot of ideas on what we can do and everyone is eager to help out, which has often led to people becoming burnt out and taking on too much. 
So we quickly learned that to keep our members productive, we needed a sustainable group culture. So that is naturally the topic of our sixth session. In the beginning, we didn't have any strategy behind our events and we didn't know what outcomes we were aiming for. We focused all our attention on the best creative tactics. What I learned though, is that by having an effective strategy, we were able to link our events to each other and to our goal. We were able to gauge our success and our strategy actually informed which creative tactics we used. Session seven is about how to craft strategy and creative tactics. Once we knew what our goals were and our strategy to achieve them, we could identify other groups that could help us. We were then able to form a network of local partners who could lobby for change and hold events together. Doing this involved learning how to work with other groups and it took a long time to get the hang of. Week eight of this season is about how to work with other groups. And working as an effective small group, we were recently able to secure a big win by getting our council to draft with us a net zero emissions strategy. We're now having lots of conversations about the climate crisis with members of our community. And with all these great wins happening, we are still as a group finding it really difficult to know how to measure and celebrate these successes. So I'm keen to attend the organizing school's final session of this season on measuring and celebrating success because my local group will really benefit from skills on this topic. So to save yourself the time of learning all these great local group skills through trial and error like me, make sure that you tune into our sessions each Thursday for the next eight weeks following today. Um, and yeah, thanks for joining us for week one of our series of how small groups make big change. I'd like to hand over to my colleague Isabella to introduce herself and share a bit more information about the program and how we'll be working together. Thanks, Will. Good evening, everyone. I am so happy to be in the Zoom room with you tonight. Um, Will, there are still people pouring in, uh, so if you could keep an eye on the waiting room and keep admitting them, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so my name is Isabella Morand. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm calling in from Kulin country from my home on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Boonwurrung people. I'm the co-founder and program manager of the Changemakers Organising School. First, and most importantly, I'm excited to welcome you all and meet you. Can I encourage you now to please introduce yourself in the chat, following the same structure I used, your name, the country you're calling from, your pronouns if you'd like to share them, and the main group or organization you're a part of. I know many of us are active in several groups, so if you could share the hat you're mainly wearing tonight, that would be appreciated. Can you please also keep yourself on mute while you're not speaking at, so that it's easier for other people to participate? I shared a bit of an explainer by email about why we introduce ourselves this way, which I'd encourage you to read afterwards if you haven't had a chance to, or if you have any questions about any of those identity markers. But briefly, we share a recognition of the traditional owners of the land we're on because this country was violently colonized and its sovereignty has never been ceded by the people who were here for tens of thousands of years before invasion. We celebrate their ongoing resistance and resilience by using the traditional name for the land we're on. I know there were some registrants from outside Australia as well. Welcome to all of you. Please share the name of the place you are, however you choose to name it. By sharing the gender pronouns we use, we acknowledge that you can't assume a person's gender by their appearance and that gender is a spectrum, not a binary. And by identifying ourselves by the group or organisation we're making change in, we start to recognise and celebrate the diversity of movements in the room. As changemakers, diversity is our strength. We'll talk about this a lot more during these sessions. If you're not sure how to answer any of those questions or you wanna know more about why we ask them, Malcolm will share the link to the explainer I shared in the email earlier again in the chat. I'm also just gonna pop up a poll now so that we can know a little bit more about the people here and um, whether you're currently taking action and, and uh, yeah, your motivations for being here. So the poll should pop up and if you can pop your answers in. And it's so great to see the intros coming through uh, seeing that we've got people from Perth and Queensland and Denmark. Um, it's so wonderful to be here with you all tonight. Um, so uh, I'll just give that poll one more second and get it out of my way. Um, great, uh, because it's our first week, um, I wanted to share a little bit more information about the organizing school and the rhythms this training will use to welcome you all into the space. So our purpose is to strengthen the leadership, knowledge, skills and relationships between the hundreds and thousands of social movement members and organisational volunteers across Australia and our broader region who want to take the crisis created and exacerbated by the pandemic and make real and deep change together. 
The organising school was founded in the first days of Australia's pandemic lockdown, one year ago now, so that people who wanted to take action could also have a space where they could come together and interpret how to respond. We rely on an organising approach to social change, gathering each week to learn about the relationships, power, interests, action and leadership. If you're not sure exactly what an organising approach, um, sorry, if you're not sure exactly what an organising approach means or how it relates to other forms of people power, I shared a blog that our co-founder Amanda wrote about different people power approaches by email and its link is just coming up in the chat as well. So we'll explore these ideas through frameworks, case studies and in breakout discussions. While you'll see the three of us from the Changemakers team, me, Will and Amanda regularly, for the most part, the training will be chaired and delivered by a variety of people from different social change movements. We'll welcome campaigners, organizers, and other troublemakers to share stories about these, how these frameworks have helped them win and what they learned along the way. We value difference and diversity and consider these a strength. We won't teach one theory of change or preach certain tactics over others. We're here to help you think strategically and to consider the strengths and weaknesses of your own approach and where you can learn from and work with others. As you join, please be mindful that this is a space of people from varying ages and different movements. There'll be people here with really different experiences and opinions to yours. I'm sure there's folks on the call tonight from a union tradition who might work really differently to the climate movement. There'll be activists here who work in direct action groups and others who use tactics more focused on policy or lobbying. Some folks who have been making change for decades and some who are much newer. This season, we're talking about how we work best together as a group and one-to-one. -one. And as organizers, we, be, we believe that building relationships is how we build power. And in a space, we're in relationship with each other. So we need to start to know each other. One way we practice this value is by making time each session for two breakout discussions. This is an opportunity for you to deepen your reflections and build relationships with people from across the spectrum of social change. When you're in your breakouts, we encourage you to learn from and challenge each other respectfully. If someone says something that you don't like, consider calling them in and talking to them about it rather than just calling them out. Sometimes diversity can be hard to hold together, but we can also agree to disagree. Social movements are strongest when there's a variety of approaches working on the same goal. I do also wanna recognize that sometimes things happen because of big power differentials between us. These are based on race, class, gender, ability, and age. The social change space is not exempt from the power structures that are prevalent in our society more broadly. If something happens in a breakout that you wanna raise with us, you can press the ask for help button at the bottom of your screen. Or if anyone has concerns or wants to talk after the session, please reach out to me. You can reply to any of our emails and it'll come to me directly or just send me a message in the chat box. As well as the breakout chats, we'll use interactive slide decks. This means when the time comes, we'll post a link in the chat to a set of editable slides. We'll ask you as a group to take some notes about your discussions tonight. Some weeks, the slides will have activities or other things to respond to as well. If you're confident with this, please step up to support others in your breakout. The breakouts, of course, aren't enough time to cover everything. We've also got a Facebook group where you can continue any interesting conversations or connect with others in the program. The link's in the chat and I'll also share it around in an email afterwards. We'll be looking for other ways to make space for you to connect outside the class through the season as well. So at the organizing school, we also value accountability. Here are some things you can expect from us every week. We'll start and finish on time. Here in Melbourne, that's 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. We'll protect your relational and breakout time. It's really important to us that this is not seen as a space where the people presenting hold all the answers and you are empty vessels to fill. You are fill vessels as well, and we wanna learn from each other and support you to learn from each other. There'll never be a charge for this training, it's free. This is an important accessibility norm for us. We consider part of our purpose, equalizing participation and access for the grassroots movements. We'll empower through sharing with resources and help in the chat box. Uh, Malcolm is there tonight as your chat buddy um, and he can help you with any uh, tech or other questions you have as well. Every week after the session, I'll send a follow-up email with resources and a link to the recording. We'll try and equalize participation as much as is possible in a format like Zoom, uh, you know, calling on you and asking for your answers to things as well. 
will recruit from a cross sector of movements to embrace that difference that we so celebrate. The variety of guests who come will be prepped and rehearsed to make the most of our limited time together. And as a team, we debrief every session and commit to continually learning and improving the space for you. Before I finish, I wanna recognize all of you uh, for taking the time to be here, taking the time out of your busy lives as change makers and as regular people with lives and families, and for the commitment to yourselves and each other and change making that you've shown just for showing up tonight. So that's enough of my voice for now. We're gonna jump into our first breakouts so you can start to get to know each other and Will will share some more information about that. Thank you, Isab. In just a minute, you'll be automatically pushed into breakout rooms to connect with new people and reflect on what you've heard so far. There's a link coming in the chat to a slide deck. Take notes in the slide that matches your group number so we can share in your reflections. Pick someone in the group to facilitate and keep track of time and someone to take notes. We're relying on you to make sure that everyone gets a chance to contribute in the breakouts. If you're someone who usually talks a lot, try to step back. And if you're feeling shy, challenge yourself to speak up. We have so much to learn from each other. In this breakout, you should introduce yourselves, share why you've joined this training and what kind of social change work you do and help people know you. Share something about yourself outside of the social change space. As you connect, look for the things you have in common and for the things that make you different. Reflect on these if you get time. Those questions are in the slides as well. So in case you forget them, they're in the chat also. You'll have about 10 minutes and you'll get a one minute warning before we come back. We'll be hearing from the other speakers after this. Have fun. And yeah, I hope you had a really good time. I got to meet lots of new people. Uh, for the next nine weeks, we'll be talking about how we can build big change in small groups. But before that, why are we actually looking at small groups? Where do the idea of small groups come from? Are they new or are they old? Who's used them before and what did they learn? Uh, we have three speakers who, who will explore this. First is Amanda Tattersall, one of our very own change makers. Then after Amanda, we will hear two people who've used small group strategies to great success in the field. For those who don't know, Amanda is a co-founder of The Organising School and host of the Changemakers podcast. She's worked with movements using small groups from the union movement to healthcare movements in Canada, from Student Strike for Climate and parent and citizens groups. I'll hand over to Amanda. Awesome. Thank you, Will. And um, it is so exciting to have so many people here from small groups around the country. I noted that 93% of you said that you're currently actively working in small groups. So um, it's an important conversation for us to have before we get into the mechanics of it about like why they're important. So you know, I think in recent times in social movements, there's been uh, a lot of discussion that that you know, small groups are the, the latest thing, right? They're the new cool thing to do when you're building a social movement. But a lot of that discussion implies that the idea of small groups are new to social change. And I just want to start the presentation by talking about how small groups are not new. They're very, very old. And there's a long, a long history of how major social change has been achieved by using this exact method that you're using today. So let's go back a couple of thousand years and if we can put up the slides, I don't know if the slides are up, but if we can put up the slides, let's go to the church, right? I know that uh, some, some activists are very involved in churches and some probably feel uncomfortable about me raising it, but actually this tradition of working in small groups goes right back to the formation of the Christian church. Think 12 disciples. Um, but you don't just need to go back that far. You can look at the work of the formation of the Methodist Church in the 1700s, who explicitly used a cell structure to be able to build their institution. And John Wesley, who was one of the, you know, who's was, was part of the Methodist movement, but if you have heard of the Uniting Church, one of their tenants is, um, comes from Methodism and John, John Wesley, um, built that movement using small groups, but first initially across the United Kingdom. Groups of 10 to 12 people, they were called class meetings, and they were be, uh, built on a practice of not just faith, but on action. Indeed, John Wesley is very famous for um, advocating for the abolition of slavery, which was also a place 
that came to use small groups. So you may have heard of the abolitionists movement, the anti-slavery abolitionist movement, which was active in the United Kingdom and active in the United States, and both of them use small groups. In 1838, over 1,350 local chapters uh, of the, of the anti-slavery um, movement existed in, in the US and ha housing 250,000 people. Um, people often look to the emancipation in the Civil War as what stopped slavery, but it was these groups that created the space for that success. But what about Australia? Do we have any history of doing small groups? Well, yes, indeed we do, thanks for asking. So um, the Labor Party, now I know how much everyone here probably loves the Labor Party, but whatever you think of them now, if you go back in history, actually this mass-based progressive political institution was based on the formation of small groups that, that emerged and arose out of worker struggle around the depression in the 1890s and the strikes that uh, featured around that time. In every state, um, the formation process was in small groups. If you're from Queensland, if people here from Queensland, you can you can wave. We know that, that your uh, party formed under a, a meeting that was held under the tree of knowledge. I'm from Sydney um, and we know that the party here was formed again in a small group meeting at Balmain Town Hall. Still, you join a state organisation in the Labor Party and you're allocated to a local branch. The branches are where people participate in this space, right? Branches, local groups, that's the point. Small groups are a space where every single person can participate. And small group practices underpin some of Australia's most significant social movements way before this period of activism. Let's go to the Viet movement against the Vietnam War. So the moratorium movement against Vietnam. Now. It's one of the most successful social movements in Australia, one of the most successful anti-war movements in the world. And look, it's famous for housing and incubating a, a bunch of radical leftist social, um, social forces that all didn't like each other very much at the time, but they work together to make change, right? But what also happened during the moratorium movement was the formation of local groups in an urban and regional setting. New people became politicized, witnessing war crimes, conscription, the return of dead bodies, and they became politically active for the first time in the suburbs. And they did that through forming small groups. Those groups, interestingly enough, um, I've just been doing some interviews with people involved in this movement, um, channeled that radical, so there was a pathway where people went from group, uh, from non-participation into group participation, and many of them actually joined the Labor Party. It's a story that's not really told why Whitlam's Labor Party was so progressive. Part of it was because that these social, this social movement in introduction and insurgency into the Labor Party in the early 1970s, so curious. Another movement was full of small groups and that's the Franklin Dam movement. So people have probably heard of, um, of that movement. It began as a small group. In 1976, Bob Brown uh, housed a meeting of 16 people at his house to work out what could they do to stop this terrible dam that would destroy enormous um, levels of forest in, um, in Tasmania. People signed up to blockades and how did they do it? They were affinity groups. They were small groups of six to 10 people, right? Constantly these small spaces where people could be organized together and be held accountable to each other as ways where people could participate in strategy and not just as, um, not just as turned out to a rally. They were the active members of these movements. Mainlanders came to support the, the, the Franklin Dam um, campaign and how do they do it? They formed groups across the country. So much to the point we probably have some, I think we've got some Wilderness Society people here today. The Tasmanian Wilderness Society after this fight changed its name to the Wilderness Society to enable the incorporation of all the groups that had formed around the country, right? People have been doing this for a long time. Small groups can make massive change. So Margaret Mead, said, you probably heard this quote, we've got, we're going to put it up on a slide, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Small groups can make big change, right? The spaces that you are currently in can be transformative to global change. It's happened for the last 400 years and it will continue to happen. But not all people power is made equal. 
and not all groups are equally powerful. I'm going to run through some of the elements of small group power that we're going to feature over the next nine weeks and that we're going to work through with you as insights as to whether these questions can help us make us stronger and maybe help diagnose how to make our own work better um, as we try and achieve big change. So I've got like the who, how, where and networks uh, are the elements that I've drawn out. So who? It matters who's in your group, right? Small groups are a space that provides for participation, right? That's great. That's their purpose. They also provide for leadership development. So when you're in a group, you learn leadership skills that teach you how to be a strong citizen, right? They, a stronger citizen. You learn about power. You learn about how to, how to work with others and you learn how to advocate for your own, for the transformation of the issues that you care about, right? You learn how to be an active citizen. They're incredibly powerful. Um, but, they, but groups vary. How diverse is your group? Is your group, every, everyone around the table look the same as you or are they different? Are they different? Do they come from different traditions and different ways of thinking or um, are you in a space that's very comfortable where you're not challenging each other in terms of how you see and think about the world? Groups vary in their power depending on how diverse they are. And in general, more, more diverse, the more diverse the group, the more robust and powerful it is. But it's not always and exactly like that. I'll give, we'll give you some examples. I think it's in week three or four when we break down what um, organizational culture in groups looks like. Um, groups also vary in how they recruit people as well. You know, do you just uh, mobilize anyone you can get, go to a street stall and sign up everyone? Or do you do a power analysis and go and seek out to recruit people who you know who are going to be powerful for your network? It, the who varies your power. Secondly, how? How does your group work? What are, we talk about group culture. We've got a whole session on that in a couple of weeks. What are the, we define culture very simply, the practices and habits that you repeat over time. What practices and habits does your group repeat over time? Are your meetings joyful and enthusiastic, always finishing on time and being um, just brilliant in every way? Or do they go too long? Are they dull? These are really important questions for us to ask and they vary how powerful how groups can be. Um, does your group just talk or does it act? If it does a lot of action, does it also reflect or is it just do the same thing over and over again, right? You know, you know Einstein said you do the same thing over and over again is a definition of insanity. Is, is that happening in your space? How can we change that over time? Where? Where is your group, right? They're local, they're, lo they're locally rooted small groups. So there's nothing more powerful than something that's rooted in place because messengers matter. You know, some highfalutin person from the inner city can pretend to advocate on an issue, but if someone is actually speaking from the community with affected people, they've got more power and more authority, right? We know that, you all know that. That's why you're important. But what geography are you standing on? Are you regional? Are you urban? Is your group is the terrain of your group, the territory of your group small or is it large? We know that groups tend to work more powerfully if they're regional because the proximity of work to home, and there's a lot of overlap of relationships, but we still need really strong groups in the urban core because actually that's where lots and lots of the population live, right? We need these groups in different places, but where they are matters. And finally, networks. Is your group connected? So we know that we can't win on our own. We also can't win on just in our own group. We need transformational change requires action at a variety of scales. And across all those historical examples, the local small groups, they were networked with each other. But who sets the strategy in that network? Is it directed by someone in Sydney or Melbourne? Or is there control or impact for the strategy held in a small group? There's... Um, Lots of different language about this that's going to come up over the weeks. Uh, there's a phrase called a directed network, where a centralized strategy is it sort of is shared across a bunch of a bunch of groups, a directed network. But there's a different way of looking at it. People might have heard of subsidiarity. It's a, a Catholic tradition where the where decision making descends to the most local space possible. A different way of a more decentralized way of a building strategy. I've done a lot of research on this question because I um, am a nerd for social change and there is a perpetual tension around questions of scale that we are going to talk about 
across the, the this course, which is that, you know, at the local, there's real power and participation and at, at its extreme, there can be autonomy. But at the centre, you also need a centre because there is a need for a national or globally scaled strategy, which requires coordination. And instead of suggesting that you always need coordination or you always need autonomy and participation, I found that actually holding those two things in tension and constantly need, constantly negotiating between the local and the coordinated is the only way to effectively manage scale over time. I know that sounds abstract. I've got a whole thing written on it and we're going to talk about it later. But before I wrap, I just want to, that was a lot of information. Oh my God, she can talk very fast. Apologies. I'll try not to talk very fast all the time. But why don't we just turn to the chat? Okay, and this is really an inv invitation. We're going to try to have time to talk out in a breakout group, but let's just have a moment in the chat. Is there something, think about your group. We just said a whole bunch of things about groups. Think about your group. Is there something that your group does really well around how, where, who networks? Or is there something that is a challenge as it's sort of an area where you think, actually, I really would like to learn more about how to do that thing differently. So I'd really ask people to put stuff in the chat now. I'm going to open up the chat too. We're going to move on to the next piece. But what I'll do is I'll take some notes and after the breakouts, we're going to have some discussion. So I'll be able to answer any questions if there are any, but also we'll take some of this knowledge into our planning as we put together the, the sessions as, as they come. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Amanda. You're right, that is a lot, but uh, it's so interesting to, to have that look at the history of local groups, or of small groups, sorry, and all the different influences that affect them. That was really interesting for me. Um, I now am going to introduce Paul um, as our second speaker. Paul has worked for unions in a range of roles since 1999. He has spent about half that time organizing and campaigning in local communities. He was a lead organizer of small groups in the Northern Rivers region for the Your Rights at Work campaign. He's also researched and written on workers' movements for a living wage and currently works on union education programs at the ACTU. Unfortunately, he's not able to be here today uh, and he recorded this video message for you all. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Amanda and Will, for the invitation. I'm joining you from the land of the Wurundjeri Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, um, and I give my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So I'm going to talk to you really briefly about the Your Rights at Work campaign and the, the Your Rights at Work groups that were formed um, through uh, 2005 to 2007 and how those groups have sort of carried on what the activities they've done since and a bit about what we learnt with working with groups because it was quite a new thing for unions to work in local communities in the areas where people lived and worked and all that was a response to uh, the Howard government's introduction of the work choices legislation. This was just after Howard had gained uh, had gained control of the Senate, um, in which happened after the, the 2004 election when Howard defeated Mark Latham and what those laws were were basically the worst attack on the conditions of working people that we'd ever seen in this country and were they not defeated then uh, Australia's workplaces and living conditions of everyone would be a lot different than what they are now. Now they basically enabled most employers to sack anybody for any reason without any recourse. They enabled employers to sweep, to undercut, you know, any existing conditions in award and agreements with individual contracts that didn't have to pass any sort of uh, test that they didn't disadvantage people. And it also severely restricted the ability of unions to uh, access workers and workplaces and, um, and organise. So we knew that it was a matter of survival, or the union movement knew it was a matter of um, survival and for the defence of, you know, working conditions that had been built up over over a century uh to an imperative to get rid of these laws now initial response was i guess in some ways a traditional union movement response where um i'm just going to share my screen sorry uh so in some ways a traditional union movement response which was um uh, which we, you know, we, we ran legal appeals. We had rallies as well. We also, um, so I think it was a bit different was we put ads on television immediately, uh, which actually spelled out how bad these laws were. And I think it was successful in capturing the narrative and setting up some momentum. So when we did have these rallies, a lot of them were 
broadcast by Sky Channel into, into um, you know, RSL clubs and rooms of people of, full of union delegates who lived and worked in the same areas. Um, and at the end of those broadcasts, uh, people would end up, you know, sitting in the room, looking at each other. They've probably never been in a room together before um, and going, well, this is really terrible. What are we going to do about it? And that was really the foundation of the Your Rights at Work groups. Now, the union movement had run had 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 rallies in the streets the biggest rallies ever about industrial relations would also run the legal challenges neither of those things worked so it became imperative that um the only way to get rid of these laws was to get rid of the government that introduced them so uh and that was the foundation of the industry of the your rights at work campaign so um all of these groups we we learnt essentially i i was um uh that was i took the photo at the top that's outside grafton rsl club uh, in 2007 when Howard visited and I was um, seconded as the organiser to the seat of Page in the uh, Northern Rivers of New South Wales. And I set up, um, worked with local unions and delegates and set up six groups in uh, Lismore, Grafton, Casino, Ballina, um, Kyogle and Lower Clarence, like Iluka, um, McLean, Yamber around there. And, um, and those groups were really uh, some great people amongst them. And we managed to you know, mobilise about 300 people on polling day with all of these um, activities right up into the lead up, right in the lead up on the local media. And but on polling day, we had three, 300 people um, handing out in about 80 polling booths um, right across. And that led to a 7.2% swing, which was enough to defeat the incumbent nationals, the area is a real national party stronghold. And that played out across the country. And out of the 25 seats that were targeted around the country with uh, resourced with a local organiser, the um, uh, the I think it was all but a couple of them um, fell for the government and a couple of more did as well. So of course, so, and then, you know, that resulted in the defeat of the Howard government and, um, and so on and so forth. So what did we learn about groups? The um, so, and some of these groups, you know, obviously carried on through campaigns against electricity privatisation and are still around in some form all around New South Wales. But what did we learn about groups? One of the things is getting people together with a shared understanding around what the group is, so its makeup and its purpose. So, so people being clear on what brings them together, what the plan is and what their part is in it. So that role clarity is really important. Um, having a minimum formal structure, so but led by a core team is really important. Um, and I think it also relates to, you know, look, why do we work with groups? Because when they're working properly, um, a group is, you know, this, it's great. The impact of a group is greater than the sum of its parts. So uh, when people act in a group, they begin to generate their own ideas, generate their ownership, and that's how an organiser can can scale things up. And we talk about organisers as being, oh, sorry, that's, um, yeah, where, you know, the groups came up until, you know, a couple of years ago, we had groups all over New South Wales um, that all had their own sort of logos and identity. Um, we talk about organisers as being wallpaper. So the organiser isn't the leader in the group. The organiser uh, sort of supports the group, facilitates, creates the circumstances for the group to establish its own identity, its own ownership over its own program, because that's when things begin to scale up. And something changes in groups when, when they're working, is it changes from uh, them undertaking the activities that the organiser suggests to them, to then the organiser, you know, finding out about the activities that they've come up with and organised themselves all um looking to that uh to to that objective so i think what made them work was when there was a identifiable community of interest and for us that was when it worked better in you know regional towns really where where there was a a distinct local identity um having so having logos with a local identity really helped and that sort of thing that they helped um design themselves Another thing, and I'll leave you with this, is in terms of what makes groups work is diversity in the makeup of the group. So I find that people behave differently and more conducive to uh, building up a plan and more um, when there's diversity in the group. So when you've got um, older people and younger people, people from different cultural backgrounds, people from different industries in our case, you know, people who work in blue collar areas in uh, white call areas or health workers with transport workers, etc. So um, people behave differently and accommodate other people better. So I think one of the things that um, is important to do if there's a certain, you know, homogeneity amongst um, a group you're working with, it's actually good to think about 
uh, who you can bring in to make the group more diverse, because I think that's one of the things that uh, that we've learned that um, that make them work better. But look, I'll leave you with that. There's a lot more that I could say and unpack, but I really wish you all the best with uh, with your work in getting people together to get the power they need to get the change that they want and enjoy the rest of your training. Thanks so much. Yeah, I really want to uh, thank Paul for that. Uh, while he couldn't be here, he took the time out of his day to record that for us. Um, and he did a great job of it. So I really uh, want to appreciate Paul in this moment. Um, I also just wanted to really quickly reflect on, on how much that overlapped with what Amanda was saying and how we talked about identity um, and how he talked about um, diversity and how that improved how the groups worked. Um, and it was also really interesting to see how these groups that he created in 2007 were all still active and using those same skills that they developed together on different campaigns, like many years later. Uh, and it was interesting to see that. Um, part of how we work the organizing school is we like this to be uh, conversational and as two directional as we possibly can. So I want to invite you all to jump in the chat and share something about uh, what Paul was saying that really stood out for you um, and take a moment to do that now. I'm also going to introduce our second speaker, Mary Crooks. Uh, she has worked on community engagement projects uh, as the executive director with the Purple Sage Project um, and our watermark. In 2012, she received an Order of Australia in recognition of this work. And I'd like to hand over to Mary to introduce herself now. Hi, thanks Will, and uh, thanks to Changemakers. Uh, I'd certainly like to acknowledge country. Uh, I'm on Wurundjeri land here in Northcote, uh, but I'd also like to say that part of the challenge for all of us is to partner up and work shoulder to shoulder with Indigenous peoples. Uh, the Victorian Women's Trust, where I work, we've been in a 25 year partnership with Koori Women Mean Business, We'd like to think it's probably an unrivaled partnership between the two organisations. And it's just wonderful to hear everybody acknowledging country tonight and to know that in fact in Victoria, that practice of acknowledging country essentially started 30 years ago between women, uh, Jure Dara, who was the convener of the Women's Trust and Julie Pears, who was uh, one of the conveners for Koori Women Mean Business. Those women got together and they started essentially the custom of acknowledging country. And now here it is being done all over the place. It's fantastic. Uh, my interest in the whole uh, transformative impact of small groups uh, started with a vengeance uh, under the Kennett government in 1997 in Victoria. And in effect, I designed and ran uh, a kitchen table model of conversations around the state where we had 600 small groups across the whole of Victoria set up. Most of those were actually established under the leadership of women and the women brought the men in. Uh, we had 40 language groups involved in those discussions back then. Uh, it, it led to such a uh, un, unleashing of people's concerns and interests and, and uh, desire for change that there's a strong school of thought uh, that the Purple Sage project ended up being one of the processes that led to the defeat of the Kennett government in 1997. In fact, the Sunday Age, um, a week after Kennett lost in 1999, the Sunday Age led with a lead article in a headline saying how Purple Sage advice might have saved Jeff. Uh, I then designed the process from Purple Sage. We designed it to enable several thousand Victorians come together on a project about water and climate change. Uh, and that culminated in about um, 2007 with the publication, Our Watermark. Uh, and then probably more recently, the same model, uh, we saw great success in Indi with the election of Cathy McGowan to that seat, which was the first time uh, that it had uh, been won by an independent. I spent six months training up the 12 people who formed the Voices for Indi, training them up in this kitchen table process of uh, collaboration. Uh, and they set up 55 small groups across that electorate. Uh, they didn't think that they would, um, that 
the candidate who then um, came forward in Cathy still didn't think that they would win that seat uh, because a 9% uh, swing was required. But the process of community engagement through these kitchen table dialogues and a very smart campaign by a lot of younger people and older people uh, and a very well-credentialed candidate in Cathy McGowan led to them defying the national trend. They secured a 9% swing. Sophie Mirabella was defeated. And when Cathy retired from politics, the seat was won again by another independent, which is the first time in Australia's history that that's ever happened. And in large part, that was because of the small group, systematic small group kitchen table process that informed the campaign. So I've been involved in about 15 iterations of this small group process. Uh, in fact, our, our water project was so successful that uh, Energy Mark Australia uh, picked it up and uh, and ran it as their their um, flagship way of, of rolling out Energy Mark. I've done it for the Richmond Greens in Melbourne. I've done it with a group of people in Canberra, and I've even done it with the um, new AFL Fans Association in Victoria, where they actually brought 110 people into the Richmond Football Club from all different shapes and sizes and football allegiances. Uh, and they had a small groups of, a, of about 12 uh, discussing issues affecting football fans. So that's the sort of <clears throat> interest I have in, in interpreting Margaret Mead's dictum that Amanda talked about, that never think that a group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change anything because that's the only way um, things have changed. We came up with a typology after Purple Sage about the power of people. That we talked about the power of one person, we talked about the power of 10, we talked about the power of communities, and we talked about the power of citizens. The important thing is that the power of 10 is where the small group power rests. And the other important thing is that you can actually get a lateral movement across that, the power of one, the power of 10, the power of communities, and the power of citizens. So they can actually grow from one to 10 to local communities to citizens. What I'd like to do now, though, is to just focus, I think, on some of the absolute not negotiables in, in trying to establish small groups and do them effectively uh, without being romantic about it. And they're not in order of importance, but never underestimate the skill and capacity to run a group properly. Uh, it's not rocket science. But, but never underestimate uh, that all you've got to do is click your fingers and somehow things occur. You have to be careful, you have to be thoughtful, uh, you have to negotiate, uh, you have to be absolutely upfront and honest in your dealings with people. You have to be authentic uh, and you mustn't play games with people. You have to be absolutely honest uh, and not run um, overt, uh, covert agendas, uh, which, which really runs the risk of being seen to use people. Uh, you do not use people for your own agenda. Um, you have to operate on the basis of respect and civility. These are not luxury touches, uh, but we are nothing. We are nothing in our relationships with people in small groups if we're not prepared to give decent respect to people and and to earn have earn your own respect amongst people. But importantly, small groups have to be purposeful. Uh, they have to be seen to be achieving some kind of purpose, some kind of goal or outcome. And in our case, the kind of purposeful nature of small groups is to move people from opinion to owning an issue, to being prepared to look for solutions and being prepared to accept solutions, even if they're not your own ideas. But people, by and large, don't want to sit around and work and talk with one another unless it's going to be yielding something constructive. The process has to be quality process. You have to attend to the detail. Uh, so even, for example, when we welcome people into our small groups, we'll make sure that the tables are clean, that there's food and drink, uh, that we look after people. Um, so that even to, it sounds a bit silly, but even to actually make sure that the tables are clean is you're showing respect you're showing respect that people have come and they're prepared to sit down with you. You need ground rules. You need clear roles and responsibilities. 
you need to show how accountable you are for listening to people in that small group, what you're going to do with what you've heard in that small group. Uh, and you, you must do everything you can not to set groups up to fail. Uh, there can be some bad group experiences, but you should be striving all the time to make sure that the group experience is positive, it's constructive, uh, it's relationship based, uh, it value adds to everybody's experience and it builds solidarity and respect amongst people. Uh, so let me just um, end by, by saying that in about five weeks time, uh, we will have on the website of the Victorian Women's Trust, we will have a, a resource document for all of you and for everybody else across the country who wants to maybe think hard about how you can mobilise people uh, using this small kitchen table conversation model. There's a lot of talk about it ever since INDI especially. A lot of people think they know what it is uh, and, and, and they're hungry for um, advice and support. So we've thought at the Women's Trust it's time that we made the implicit explicit. And so in about four or five weeks time, I'm hoping that we'll be able to load this resource onto our website uh, and, uh, and that you can access it as a, access it as a, um, a resource for your efforts. Um, all I wanted to say is that uh, setting up small groups, being part of a small group, running small groups properly, uh, is not just a, a warm, fuzzy, feel-good um, uh, um, situation. It is about strong, meaningful, purposeful social engagement with one another. And if you can use it to pull off change, it's even more powerful. Uh, so thank you, Will uh, and Isabella, for the chance to talk. Uh, and, uh, and I wish you all well. Thank you very much, Mary. We really appreciate you taking the time to um, come and talk with everyone tonight. Um, and I think something that resonated a lot with me with what you were saying right there at the end um, was how important it is that groups are purposeful and, and, and aim to have an effect and create change and are not just places where, you know, we're catching up with friends and talking. Like there's a distinction there. Um, as for your link, uh, what happens at the end of each session is we do a follow-up email that has the slides, um, a link to the recording, um, and some resources. And when that comes out, we'll do that um, at the end of that respective session. Uh, now we are going to move into a breakout. Um, in this breakout, we are going to discuss uh, three questions. Firstly, what is the greatest strength? Um, and what is a striking challenge that you face in your small group? So you already had a chance to put that in the chat, but now you're reflecting on it with other people and seeing what else they put in. Um, find if any of those challenges are actually shared by several people in your group. Um, and then um, if, is there a question or comment that you have for Mary or Amanda? We'd really appreciate that you put those into the slides and the link to those slide decks has been put into the chat. So we are able to see the slides and um, we'll look through and any great comments and questions um, for Mary or Amanda, we will reflect on after this breakout session, Amanda will. Um, so make sure that someone in your group again is the slide, uh, is, is taking notes in the slides. Um, make sure you have the slides open, go to your respective um, group, um, your group slide that you have with the number of your group in it. Um, and it's the second one down. So you've, you've gone through the first lot of the slides. Um, there's your group from the first breakout and then you're having the second breakout. So see you at the other side. Anyway. Welcome everyone. I hope I could see your uh, extensive chats on the slides and, and sort of delighted in the fact that most of it was exchanging comments about strengths and challenges in your own group and discussing what was going on more so than asking any particular questions. But Mary and I had a little bit of a chat in the breakout and she's, I'm just going to give her a couple of minutes to just throw in a little bit more food uh, and react to a couple of the comments around um, that came up in terms of how you, how you feed groups or how you start groups. Mary, do you want to just some final final food for the for everyone who's come on tonight? Who, you know, final thoughts that they can take away as they go back into their groups.
I can't see you, but I'm, I'm wondering if that mute button is. I'm unmuted now. <laughs> okay. Um, look, I think what you're what you're setting out to do over several weeks is really commendable, uh, because because you can't just miraculously create small groups. You can be well intentioned. Uh, you can have the energy. Uh, you can have the ideas and the enthusiasm, but it does require careful thought, not just by yourself, but with others coming around you. Uh, so, so I'm a bit loath to say too much more because the risk is making it sound as though it can all be dealt with in a matter of minutes. What I would say that I didn't say um, <clears throat> in my quick romp was how important when you're being honest and authentic, it's very important that you are that you make your values, your core values clear, uh, so that so that people understand where you're coming from, and people are more likely to join in an effort of solidarity if there is an alignment of values. Um, so making so I want to give you a quick example of that. In when I worked for Voices for Indi. Um, it's fair to say that there was a lot of slagging off about the local member by this group of people. And the work I did with them to make their values clear about what does Voice for Indi stand for? And the first thing they said is respect, respect for democracy, respect for our political elected reps, respect for each other and so on. So they had it all. And I said, well, that's great. But if you're going to say that Voices for Indi values respect, then you're going to have to zip your lips from today onwards and stop slagging off your local member. And so they did. So you can't you can't have it both ways. You know, so you've got to be clear about your own values. The only other thing I'd say is that I think small group success happens when everybody brings their best sides. That's what it's about. You bring your best side, not not your half best, not your narky best, but your best side. And small groups that work to other people's best sides are more likely to enjoy confidence and success. So I just think as a general rule, don't even think about small groups unless you're prepared to bring your best side to it and to work to others' best sides. Now that's not, that's not a romantic view. That's about getting along constructively in life, frankly. Thank you, Mary. Isn't it special having literally one of the most experienced small group operators in the country with us on this call? Like, just like hugely, I've been, I met Mary the best part of 20 years ago. Sorry to reveal your experience, Mary, you know, um, and was in awe of the Purple Sage project, let alone what she's done since. So it's just been an honor to have you with us here today, Mary. I similarly am not going, you know, we're going to be here for nine weeks together, friends. I feel like I'll have some time to share, but I'm, I'm going to say one thing. A bunch of the slide reflections talked about the challenges of working with people, whether it was getting people to be more active in the groups, working out how to inspire them to do more activity in the groups, getting people to stop just being all talk and doing action. Right, this question about how do we connect better? How do we motivate people to do the stuff that we need doing? Well, all I would say is welcome to week two, friends. That is going to be the entire focus of next week. How to, and I, and I'm, I intend to try and do a little bit of a blowing up of our minds rethinking on this question, because I think sometimes we sometimes get these questions um, around the wrong way when we're thinking about how to involve people in groups perhaps, and I'll give you some very practical tools that can allow us to sometimes break through what can be a really tricky process of um, creating a group of people who are different and who are active and who are deeply engaged on their passions together. So I'm going to hand back to Will and look forward to seeing you next week. Yes, thank you so much, Amanda and Mary. You're both excellent speakers. Um, we're about to, well, I'm going to wrap up because uh, it's nearly 7.30 and we like to finish on time. We're about to have an evaluation poll and that will look at um, how, um, how helpful you found tonight um, and what you learned tonight um, and how it will apply to your group. So if you can please um, 
put an indication of how you found tonight in there that will really help us um, organize these sessions. Um, as Amanda said, the next session is all about the skill of relationship building, featuring some very practical training that you can apply to strengthen your groups. It's going to be at the same time next Thursday. Um, it's not too late for others to join. Each week we will cover a standalone piece of content. If you enjoyed tonight and are excited about what's next, please share the link to register with other members of your group, with your friends on your social, on your social media. Um, get the word out there because um, obviously these are really beneficial uh, sessions. Changemakers is also a podcast and we have an episode all about small groups. The link is going to be placed in the chat. It's called Indivisible and it was a movement set up to resist Trump made up entirely of small groups. We keep this chat going in our Facebook group. Um, so please join us there. There will be a link to the Facebook group also put in the chat. Um, feel free to make a post, start um, commenting on other people's posts and start conversations about what you learned tonight, what you found interesting um, and make it a space that you want to engage with. Um, so on that note, uh, can everyone please come off mute and say goodbye. Um, thanks everyone for coming. See you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Will. Thanks, Isabella. Bye.